Good morning and welcome to the Salvation Army in Bedlington and our online worship. This morning, our topic is about prayer, enhancing our prayer life. And you know, there is nothing like enhancing our prayer life, like a crisis in our lives. And there is no crisis like the current one that we're in with the pandemic. I don't know about you, but it's drawn me closer to God in my prayer life. I want to read Psalm 121, verses 1 and 2 for you. It's probably a familiar portion of scripture. And it says, the psalmist says, I lift up my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. And so as we explore this topic of prayer this morning, I want you to just sit back and grab that cup of coffee or tea, hit pause and go get it if you need to, and then come back and hit play, grab that cup of coffee or tea, and join in with us now as we worship the Lord and we explore the topic of enhancing our prayer life.
As we enter a period of prayer this morning, I want us to reflect on a chorus that reminds us simply what prayer is, a conversation that we can have with God, where we can bring our cares and our concerns to him. Please join us or listen as we um, gather together to sing prayer chorus, When I Talk With Jesus. Bring to him my cares with his own sweet comfort, Jesus answers prayer.
Thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to share worship together again at this difficult time. We thank you for the people who help us to live our lives safely. Please influence and guide our leaders as they make vital decisions. We ask that you would strengthen and bless all NHS staff, care staff and key workers as they continue to support individuals and communities in so many ways through selfless service. We also pray that those involved in research and science will succeed in their quest for treatment and vaccines. Help us, Lord, to rely on you and your love every day. Let that love be seen in us and help us to pass on that love to others so that even at this moment, they may come to know you and be drawn close to you. Thank you again, Lord, for your reassuring presence with us each day. May we all stay safe to protect ourselves and others. Amen. God our Father, we come to you in prayer, especially at this time in our world. It is important to communicate with you when people are worried about family, their work situation and their finance. How do parents explain to their children the reason for keeping safe? We all need assurance that we worship a God who cares. Let us be aware that God listens to our prayers in all situations. Let, let us remember these encouraging words. Let nothing disturb you, nothing affright you. All things are passing. God never changes. Patient endurance attains to all things. Whom God possesses, in nothing is wanting. Alone, God suffices. Amen. Dear Lord, in, the, in this time of isolation, being apart from our loved ones and separated from our friends and family, and neighbours. We give thanks that there is nothing, not even coronavirus, that is able to separate us from your love. May your unfailing love continue to be shared through the kindness of strangers looking out for others. As we pray in our individual homes, we are united as a family through prayer, that in the darkest moments your love gives us hope and your love never fails. Amen. Dear Lord Jesus, during your ministry on earth, you showed your power and caring by healing people of all ages and stations of life, from physical, mental and spiritual ailments. We ask you to be present now for people who need your loving touch because of COVID-19. May they feel your power of healing through the care of doctors and nurses. Take away the fear, anxiety and feelings of isolation from people who are receiving treatment or under quarantine. Protect their families and friends and bring peace to all who love them. As it says in the Bible, do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. Heavenly Father, firstly we thank you that here in our church family you have kept us safe over the last weeks. You are a loving God who loves us and knows all about us. There may be people joining us this morning people who may listen in later, or people who we know who are not coping at present with daily routines. We bring them particularly to you in prayer. We remember the lonely, the stressed, the sad, the worried, those confused, the carers, and people unhappy in their home situations. We ask you to bring them help, peace and comfort in these difficult times. For ourselves, 
Help us to care as best we can for those in need. And help us as individuals in our home life and in our church life, from the youngest to the oldest, to accept and cope with the changes we may have to make. When I was asked if I would introduce the next song for our worship this morning, I must admit my first reaction was to smile, because I thought it was almost ironic at this time of lockdown to be singing words that say, He came to give us life in all its fullness. So many restrictions in place, government telling us what we can and cannot do. All around us we see ways in which the thing that has always been making up our lives have now been curtailed or removed. Life is now as we never could have imagined a few months ago, and it feels like something out of a bad dream or fantasy film. But here we are, about to sing the words, He came to bring us life in all its fullness, and they are just as meaningful for us today as they have ever been. The life Christ has brought us is not governed or controlled by the things of this world, but it is the joy, hope, and liberty of our very souls. He has set us free from the bondage, the darkness of this world. We have been liberated into the light of his love, his peace, his salvation. So let us forget lockdown for a few minutes and allow our souls to soar as we sing these words that signify a spiritual life of freedom. He came to give us life in all its That's it. 
scripture reading today is from John chapter 2, verses 1 through 12, and I'm reading from the New International Version. On the third day, a wedding took place in Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, They have no more wine. Dear woman, why do you involve me? Jesus replied, My time has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Nearby stood six stone water jars, the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial washing, each holding from 20 to 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, Fill the jars with water. So they filled them to the brim. Then he told them, Draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. They did so, and the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine. He did not realize where it had come from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. Then he called the bridegroom aside and said, Everyone brings out the choice wine first, and then the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink. But you have saved the best until now. This, the first of his miraculous signs, Jesus performed at Cana in Galilee. He thus revealed his glory, and his disciples put their faith in him. After this, he went to, down to Capernaum with his mother and brothers and his disciples. There they stayed for a few days. Good morning. I wonder if you've been counting your blessings during this time of lockdown. I was reading that the hall in the ozone layer is closing, that the scientists who monitor such things tell us that vibrations on the earth are much lower. We can see and certainly hear animals and birds much more now that the noise around is so much quieter. It makes us realize what an impact we normally have on the world. The poet W.H. Davies said, what is this life if full of care, we have no time to stand and stare? Well, many of us have time now, not only to stare, but to reflect and pray. And what a blessing that has been. Prayer is something that evolves all the time as our circumstances change. Like many of you, I learned to pray as a child. Simple prayers before bed, gentle Jesus, meek and mild, followed by a whole list of God bless mommy and daddy and Joyce and aunts and uncles and everybody else. Simple, but as meaningful as it could be, at that time that I could understand. Through the years, prayer has changed and there have been times when the prayers have been fraught and tearful, as well as peaceful and happy. Times when I was working, when it's not always easy to fit it all in. I used to think that I was a weekend prayer as I was usually too tired during the week. I know that some of you are at that stage now. I can only say, hang on in there. It gets better. We do pray, but maybe not as much or in as much depth as we would like. But retirement has given me opportunity to explore prayer and Bible study a bit more, and that has been a great blessing. There are many books telling us how to pray, and some are really helpful. But I remember one helpful hint that someone gave me, not from a book, but just from her own experience. When I complained about always getting distracted and not being able to concentrate, she suggested that I pray for whatever the distraction was. And I found that to be extremely useful advice. 
Sometimes though, distractions can be useful. I'm going to have to make an admission here and you're going to think that I'm a bit mad. But every morning I have a routine. I walk the dog, I come home for breakfast, and then I sit in a, in a comfortable chair and have my quiet or thinking time. Now at this time, I find it helpful to play computer games. I know it sounds crazy, but these simple, mindless games, nothing remotely complicated, they occupy about a quarter of my mind and I have opportunities to think about all kinds of other things. It seems to keep the distractions at bay. Some of my best ideas for the home league have come during these times. I'm able to think and pray about people, circumstances, situations, and any and everything else that comes to mind. I can't explain this, but maybe we, or some of us at least, can't concentrate on one thing, even prayer. Maybe that's why many people need background music when they're working. All I know is that sometimes uh, my morning thinking time has brought great blessing. I love poetry and have several poetry books, but one I turn to regularly is our own Salvation Army songbook. There are lovely verses there which bring great blessing. Somehow, many of these poets can express what we're feeling, but we don't have the gift of putting that into words. One, pers one part of a verse which I've been thinking of says, prayer is the soul's sincere desire, uttered or unexpressed. Now perhaps you're one of those people who pray uh, out loud even in your private prayers. And if it works for you, that's absolutely great. But many of us, me included, fall into the second category, the unexpressed people, for whom prayer, however you can manage it in your own life, is a very real, sometimes spasmodic, but always essential part of your life. One thing I can testify to is that it becomes more interesting and necessary as life goes on. Hello, it's Philip Gray. I'm sat in my garden shed come office, come workshop, come refuge. So what you see around me is my hobby and my work. I've been asked to talk about prayer. Now when I first came to the Salvation Army, I wanted to be part of everything, like everybody, enthusiasm. But the bandmaster, Dick Wielden, who I admired greatly, said, you don't need to go to the knee drill, that's the Sunday morning prayer meeting before the holiness service, if there's any of you old enough to remember all that. He said, come to the prayer meeting during the week and learn about prayer. So I went to the midweek prayer meeting run by him and the Sergeant Major and learnt about prayer. I learnt about not repeating yourself. I learnt about when you've got nothing to say, shut up and give God a chance to speak to you. You know the old two ears, one mouth, use them in that proportion. I learnt about public prayer and private prayer. Public prayer is where you pray but you don't preach a sermon in your prayer. Public prayer is praise and worship. Private prayer is dealing with your issues and the issues that surround you. All went well till I was in Scotland and I paid a visit to a Roman Catholic priory and got to know the brothers there very well and learned a great, great deal about contemplative prayer. It was interesting, me in my Salvation Army uniform and they in their monks' abbots 
sharing prayer and experiences. After that, I seem to have become part of the Franciscan movement. I liked regular prayer. I liked to use a set service of prayer. Something to carry me from the chaos of the day to the peace and tranquility of a time with my God. The tranquility of the, the, the chaos of the day. <laughs> Try being a minister. You know, when people say, oh, the toilets are blocked. There's none of this, there's none of that. There's no toilet paper. Oh, sometimes it's just so nice to become absolved in prayer that everything drifts away and you become refreshed and renewed. And I suppose then you're ready to put the gloves on and clean the toilet out. But that's life. It was the great help for me was having people teach me about prayer and tell me what prayer isn't. Hope you made something of that. I'll see you all as soon as we get back from this lockdown. Until then, keep well, keep away from others, but keep them in your prayer. God bless. Bye. Want to see a father's face ashen or hear mother gasp? Then sit nearby as they discover three words on the box of a new toy. Some assembly required. What follows are several late night hours of squeezing A into B, bolting D into F, and hoping no one notices if steps four, five, and six are skipped altogether. Parents want a gift for their child. What they get is a project, sometimes a project for life. Some assembly required. It's not the most welcome sentence, but it's an honest one. Marriage licenses should include those words in large print. Job contracts should state them in bold letters. Babies should exit the womb with a toe tag, some assembly required. Life is a gift, albeit disassembled. It comes in pieces and sometimes falls to pieces. Part A doesn't always fit part B. The struggle seems large and inevitably something is missing. It's such a common problem. Who among us doesn't have an area of life that isn't working? How do you respond when the pieces don't fit? In frustration? In anger? In prayer? I'd like to say I always respond in prayer, but the truth? I'm a recovering prayer wimp. My thoughts sometimes zig, then zag, then zig again. If attention deficit disorder applies to prayer, then I'm afflicted. But I also know there's power in prayer, even simple prayers. Mary, the mother of Jesus, knew this too. Maybe you've heard this story. A couple thousand years ago, there was a common wedding in Cana. The bride wasn't the daughter of an emperor. The groom wasn't a prince. Apart from one detail, the event would have been lost in time. But we remember it because Jesus was on the guest list. While Jesus was there, the wedding ran out of wine. Enter Mary, mother of Jesus. For my nickel, she appears too seldom in scripture. 
After all, who knew Jesus better than she? So, on the rare occasion, she speaks up. The mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. Consider this prayer of Mary. The pieces didn't fit, so she took the problem to Jesus. Mary wasn't bossy. She didn't say, Jesus, they are out of wine, so here is what I need. Go down to the grove at the corner, accelerate the growth of some Bordeaux grapes, turn them into wine. She didn't try to fix the problem, nor was she critical. If only they had planned better, Jesus. People just don't think ahead. What is society coming to? Nor did she blame Jesus. What kind of Messiah are you? If you truly were in control, this never would have happened. She didn't blame herself. It's all my fault, Jesus. Punish me. I failed as a friend. Now the wedding is ruined. The marriage will collapse. I am to blame. None of this. Mary didn't whine about the wine. She just stated the problem. Then Jesus said to her, Woman, what does your concern have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Whatever he says to you, do it. Apparently, Jesus had no intention of saving the wedding banquet. This wasn't the time nor the place that he had planned to reveal his power. But then Mary entered the story. Mary, someone he loved with a genuine need. So what did he do? Jesus told the servants to fill the water pots with water and that water became wine that the whole party enjoyed. Problem presented, prayer answered, crisis avoided. All because Mary entrusted the problem to Jesus. Her simple request prompted a divine response. Like me, you might think if you take your problems to Jesus every time you have one, you'll talk to Jesus all day long. I think that's the point. After all, the writer of Philippians reminds us in a key verse, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God your needs and don't forget to thank him for the answers. When life doesn't fit, it's easy to, be, to worry or be critical or try to fix it. But let's let Mary be our model. She took her problem to Jesus and she left it there. She stated her problem simply, presented it faithfully, and trusted him humbly. During these times, we can't use time as an excuse because we've got plenty of it. We can spend time with God in prayer. It doesn't have to be extravagant. It can be a conversation with a friend. We can spend this time in prayer for our neighbors, for our friends, we can keep a journal of who we've prayed for and what we've prayed about and how God has answered those prayers. I want you to think about those you would normally be sitting by on a Sunday and be with throughout the week and pray for them this week. Then 
pray for your neighbors and those you would normally see in the grocery store or in the pharmacy or out on a walk. Those people that you don't necessarily know real well. Then as you pray, I want you to do these seven things. One, I want you to pray from your heart. I want you to truly care about the people you're praying for. Two, I want you to pray regularly on a regular basis. Three, pray in detail. Whatever detail you know, express that to God. Four, pray with faith. Jesus tells us to pray believing we will receive. Five, pray with love. The love of Christ should permeate our lives. Six, pray fervently. Have or display a passionate intensity when you pray. And seven, pray with a desire to help. Are you ready to get off your knees and jump in and help? Encouragement is a way to help. Cards, texts, emails, call. Let people know that you're praying for them. Sometimes that's all someone needs. They might be going through something, and all they need at that time is a call or a card in the mail saying, hey, I'm praying for you. You know that nothing I've shared today has been comprehensive. All we have to do is pray. All we have to do is be Mary. Model Mary. Let her be our model and pray more. I cast my mind to Calvary Where Jesus bled and died for me I see his wounds, his hands, his feet My Savior on that cursed tree His body bound and drenched in tears They laid him down in Joseph's tomb The entrance sealed by heavy stone Messiah still and all alone Oh, praise the name of the Lord our God. Oh, praise His name forevermore. For endless days we will sing Your praise. Oh, Lord, oh, Lord our God. And then on the third at break of dawn the son of hell 